Good morning, and welcome to the World Challenge Chapel. For all of you uh, watching online or on YouTube, thank you for being with us. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to the epistle of 1 John, we'll once again be in chapter two, and today we're starting in verse seven. This sermon is titled, Abiding in the Light. Abiding in the Light. 1 John 2, starting in verse seven says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you for your word that truly is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, I pray as we go through these tests that the Apostle John lays out that verifies and assures us of our salvation, God, that we will shine this light deep inside of ourselves, God, and find surety and strength, but God, also conviction, Lord, for our sins and for the places that we are not rightly dividing your word or or rightly living it out amongst the brethren, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would be with us, God, and that you would help us conform to the image of Christ, God, because apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, we ask these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, the name above all names, amen. Well, John has given two tests so far that validate whether or not someone is a true child of God or a child of the world, a child of darkness. The first test in chapter one is based on our faith and the confession of that faith. The second test we see in the first six verses of chapter two narrows the road even more by pointing out that those who make a confession of faith must also live according to the teaching and example of Jesus. So it's very important to remember that that a true confession of faith of who Christ is based on his word, based on what the scripture says about Jesus, that he was fully man, that he was fully God, that he lived and died and rose again, and that his death has pardoned our sins. And by faith, we believe in him. That's the first test. But the second test is that this, this confession you make with your mouth is actually being lived out in your life. This is not salvation by works. This is evidence that the Spirit of God lives in you, that we are actually disciples of the one we claim to call master. Now, John here will put forth a third test, which is the test of loving other brothers in the faith. This is centered around the teaching of Jesus that's given to us in John chapter 13 in the Gospel of John. John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus is saying basically uh, the same thing John is going to rearticulate. He's basically just teaching the message of Jesus here that he documented Jesus teaching in his gospel. 
So Jesus is saying, listen, the evidence that you belong to me will be the unity and fellowship you have with other Christian disciples. It doesn't say the love you have for the world. Yes, we do have an evangelistic love for the lost, but this is talking about something that separates us from the world. This love and unity we have as the church. Listen, love is the preeminent and overarching characteristic of the life of the true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. First and foremost, his love towards God who regenerates us and opens our eyes to the, to the truth that God has first loved us. Uh, this is what happens first. We experience, we, we finally recognize the love of God and the gospel, that he would save a wretched sinner. So to do this, we have to see God for who he is, a holy judge who, who deserves uh, perfection, who deserves all praise, glory, and honor. And then we take our lives and we compare to that righteous standard and we see that we don't live up to it. We can't live up to it. We're wretched sinners. We're hopeless, helpless. And because of these, our eyes being opened to the holiness of God and our eyes being opened to the grievousness of our own sin, we, we realize that what God is affording us in the gospel, the grace that he has given us through the, through the gospel, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that this, this love uh, wrecks us. It changes us. It explodes our hearts to a place where we, we, we realize that there's no rightful response other than ultimate surrender and reciprocating that love by living our life according to that God's commandments. This is the response that we have as true believers to the love of God and the gospel. So we realize that God has first loved us. And from this love, we love our Christian brothers and sisters with a deep love and affection. We also love our enemies and those outside the faith with a benevolent and evangelistic kind of love, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would gain eternal life by acceptance of the gospel. The Christian life is marked by love. Listen what Mark 12, 28 says. <clears throat> One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. And so Jesus is reciting the, the word of God from the book of Deuteronomy. There is nothing more important than loving God. Listen, the most important thing the Christian does is love God. But John and even Paul and other places will say that the evidence of this love for God will be by the way you treat your Christian brothers and, and by the way you treat other people made in the image of that God. There's nothing more important than loving God. And Jesus says that those who love him will keep his commands. And here John makes it clear that an external fruit or evidence of that transforming love of the Spirit of God that's living in you will be that you have love for your brother. So let's look at the, uh, the text here, starting in verse 7. John says, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. An old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So John is using a sort of Greek play on words here to say what he's saying. John, what John is really saying is that love is a divine attribute of God, and, and we see the love of God throughout the scriptures. And so in that regard, it's an old commandment. 
But John is is not inter, introducing something new. It's not like he made up a new commandment or even that Jesus made up a new commandment. What, what, what we actually have is an old commandment, but John is, is, is making it clear that he is articulating this in light of the coming of Christ. The physical manifestation of the very image and person of God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And it's very important for the people that John's writing this letter to, to hear this. Because as the false teachers are, are having private revelations and secret knowledge, and they're, they're starting to introduce things that conflict John is saying, listen, our religion is based around this word, and this word is uh, manifest to us in a person, and that person walked among us, and like he said in the first chapter, we saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our hands, and he spoke to us, like we actually had first person experience with this God. We're not just making something up. We didn't just have some vague dream. Listen, this is rooted in the scriptures that we all grew up believing. And that scripture was manifest to us in the person of Christ. And everything revolves around that light, that light that came into the world and shines and makes the darkness flee. That light is already shining. His name is Jesus. So the commandment's newness is not found in the words of the commandment, but it's found in its perfect, ex perfect expression, which was walked out before us, John says, in the light, in the person of Jesus Christ, who himself is love, who himself is life, who himself is light and truth. John is talking to believers who have the same spirit living inside of them, which this is why he says, which is true in him and in you. And so he's appealing to the fact that the truth of God has been revealed to these people. They have been transformed by it and that the very spirit of God is living in them. This light that makes them the light of the world. So when your secret revelations or your new exciting sort of religiosity or your, uh, your prophetic utterances are not in line with this, in line with the teaching of the master we have surrendered our life to, they can be discarded immediately. But he's also saying the, the, the words here are, are discernible by you because it's the spirit in you, the spirit of truth that has opened your eyes to the truth. So don't be, don't be drawn away by what worldly, godless people are saying. You'll know them by their fruit. It's easy, but the problem is, is our flesh sometimes allows us to be drawn in to this nonsense. But let's talk about what John is really trying to make the centerpiece here. And he will continue to vet out over the course of this epistle. The love of God. Oh, the love of God. You know, there's so many people who talk about the love of God and they don't know God. The love of God is, is, is fully just. It's, it's always true. You can't divorce the love of God from the truth of God. I had a person tell me one time that, that the fact that I was, you know, preaching the word to this person and correcting them wasn't very loving. <laughs> Listen, it's always loving to speak the truth. Now, obviously, you can speak the truth in an unloving way or an unpolite or caring way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's never a wrong. Listen, not only do we speak the truth in love like Paul says, but hear me, the truth itself is love because God is love and God is truth. And in him, there is no shadow of turning Let's talk about the beautiful love of God. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How about the most famous scripture in the Bible? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him, that they would not perish, but they would have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Or how about in, in, in this epistle, 1 John 3, 1. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us 
that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. It's all hinging to him, the word, the the word made flesh. How about Galatians 2.20? Paul speaking says, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, isn't it interesting that when we're talking about the love of God, especially in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, typically it's it's tied up in the gospel expression of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection, or even his life lived as God left the wonders and marvels of heaven so that he could take on flesh and walk amongst his creation, being a high priest who, who has been tempted at every, every state but never gave in, never sinned. He, he knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He is a high priest who knows what it feels like to be a human in this fallen world. And not only was his love to walk among us, but it was to take the punishment for our sin. When we talk about the love of God, you cannot divorce it from the gospel. That's why it's so important that we preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. Every time Paul or Peter or John talks about the love of God, it is irrevocably tied up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The love of God has been displayed for us. If you say you don't see God's love, It's his blood poured out on a jagged, wooden, just painful cross that Jesus died in your place. And if your eyes aren't open to how important that is, then you will never know and experience the love of God. You may benefit from it. You may benefit from common grace. You may benefit from the overflow of his love, but you will not be changed. Because listen, to see God for who he is, to see yourself for who you are, there is only one response. There's only one response, and that's to to give your whole life as a living sacrifice, to confess faith because you're desperate. God, I'm desperate without you. I can't do it without you. I I can't make it one day without you. And the truth is, is in that true confession of faith, the Spirit of God takes up residence in you and your life begins to change patterns and directions because you will begin bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, it says love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Let me say that one again. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. We live in a culture today that's telling us that delighting in evil or being tolerant towards things that God calls abominable, that that is love. I'm here to tell you that the Bible I'm reading says that love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Love is undivorceable from truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always preserves. Love never fails. Paul goes on to say, but where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And he goes on at the end of this chapter to say at the end, three things remain, hope, faith, and love. But the greatest of these is love because love is the defining attribute of God. God isn't just loving, God is love. And John is going to articulate that for us in later chapters. 
We also see this in the Old Testament, though, the love of God, this old commandment that was made alive before their eyes in the person of Jesus isn't something new. The love of God has always been displayed because God's character doesn't change. Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing this prophetic utterance of the salvation of Jesus Christ. How about this? Psalms 86, 15, it says, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. How about Psalm 136, 26? Give thanks to God of heaven. His love endures forever. Listen, if you are the object of God's love, if you realize that while you are yet a sinner, that God first loved you, and because of that, you love him back by obeying his commands, and the Spirit of God takes residence up in you, listen, that kind of love never fails. That kind of love endures forever. How about Isaiah 54, 10? Though the mountains be shaken, And the heels be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Something we have to remember about the the love of God, the agape love of God, the old translations uh, sometimes would translate the word love. Instead of making it love, they would make translate it as charity because the love God has for us is charity. It's not something we earned. It's not something that we're on the same level with. It's not give and take. It's not something we deserve. Quite the opposite is true, actually. But the love of God, listen, that love was given to us in full measure in the gospel. And for those of us who are, who are Christians, that love endures forever. It will never be taken from us. We can never be separated from us. The Romans 8, 37 through 39, Paul says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The love John is talking about for our brothers, the kind of love we show each other is God's kind of love. It's self-sacrificial. It favors others. It honors God in all things. It never undermines any of God's divine attributes. God's divine attributes. It never undermines any of God's commands. It never undermines any of God's laws. This kind of love never fails because it is rooted in the person of God. So when we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength in an ever-increasing way because the Spirit of God lives in us, John is saying that will be evidenced as being true by the way you treat your brothers. Remember that love is the preeminent characteristic of the Christian life. Love is the first fruit or evidence that the Spirit of God lives in you as given to us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And John is saying that if you, if you love your Christian brother, the, the Christian brother who's saved by the same grace you are, filled with the same spirit that you are, made in the image of God just like you are. Listen, if you can't love your brother, then maybe that spirit doesn't live in you because it's supernatural. It's not like a tit for tat or you wronged me. Listen, we love because God loved us first. And that's what's being evidenced here. If you can't show supernatural love to Christians who are in all states of their walk in your life, and we're going to talk about this at the very end of the sermon, but there are people that are in various places of sanctification. This doesn't mean that you won't have disagreements. This doesn't mean that sometimes we won't hurt each other. It doesn't mean sometimes that we won't fail in this because we still are in human flesh, that we still are fallen. But the posture of our heart, a posture of repentance, a posture that is completely grateful and and, and soul desires to please God, that person is going to be inclined 
to forgive their brothers when they wrong them, to ask for forgiveness when you wrong your brother, and to live in harmony. This is, this is not something we're trying to do to be saved. This, this unity is a characteristic of people who truly are living for the same purpose. The problem is, is that the church is filled with true Christians who are in various states of sanctification and also many false converts. So sometimes we say, well, it doesn't seem like it's working. Sometimes the unity is not there. And sometimes it's because we're not unified in the truth. That's why we, we let the truth govern our love. The truth governs our love because they're the, they're the opposite side of the same coin. The truth is never at the expense of love, and love's never at the expense of truth. I've quoted this many times, but Warren Wearsby, the famous theologian, said that, that love without truth is hypocrisy, but truth without love is brutality. And th there's no truer statement than that. Remember, that the true love of God is always truth. It's always just, as well as long-suffering, graceful, and forgiving. Truth is never absent from love. Love isn't tolerance. Hear me. Hear me, young people. Love is not tolerance of evil. Love is not doing what makes someone happy or makes someone feel good in their sin. Love is doing what's right no matter what it costs. I have a family member who, who is living in open, unrepentant sin. They are far from God. And they, and they try to pit the love of God against me sometimes when they want me to validate their sinful lifestyle. And I love them. But my first love towards them is evangelistic because I, I'm not here to validate their sinful lifestyle. Listen, I love them. I don't treat them hostile or mean. But the truth is they're constantly wanting me to validate their open, sexually immoral lifestyle, and I can't do it. Why? Because I mean no, because I love them. And be, because I'm a servant of God, I believe his word is true. And as much as they try to twist it to make their, life, their sin okay, I'll never, I'll never change in my, my posture towards them because my hope is one day the truth will win out in their lives and, and they will be saved. If they hate me all of my life or if they think I'm a jerk all of my life, um, but at the very end come to the saving knowledge of the truth and we'll be together in eternity forever. I just said this a second ago quickly, but let me say it one more time. Love is not doing what makes people happy. Love is doing what's right on behalf of someone no matter the personal cost, no matter if they call you a hater, no matter if they use it against you, it is being loving with the truth in every situation. Verse nine through 11, it says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is talking about salvation. If you're walking in darkness, it means that you are not a believer, that you are not a Christian. Walking in the light means that you are in Christ. We're not talking about human emotion we are talking about the supernatural love of God that never fails as evidence that you truly belong to him. And I'm gonna say this, and, and, and I hope it's, you don't think it's me patting myself on the back. I just want you to understand this. There is no person in the world who has ever wronged me or mistreated me or, or done something wicked to me, hurt me, that I wish hell upon, not one. There's not one person that I hope doesn't come to the saving knowledge of God. What is that rooted in? It's rooted in the fact that I realize the only reason I'm saved is because of the grace and mercy and love of God. So how could I, a, a wretched sinner who has been extended grace and mercy and love and sonship, not want that for any person who has ever wronged me outside the faith? And so that being said, how much more do I want to walk in fellowship with my brothers and my sisters. 
I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that every uh, disagreement is easily overcome, but I'm saying the heart of true believers is wanting to glorify God more than anything else. And so we'll use the truth to reason together and to come to agreement. It's a supernatural love. It's evidence we belong to him. That's what he's saying. John's saying, listen, here's the, t- here's the third test. If you, if you hate your brother and you think you're a Christian, you're wrong. You are wrong. How could you ever hate someone if the love of God, the spirit of God living in you is, is, is truly there, the, the supernatural love of God? How could you hold a wrong against somebody when you have been forgiven a lifetime of wrongs, past, present, and future? This is verse nine and 10. And here's what it's saying, that this kind of love also will not cause a brother to stumble, which is talking about sinning. Now, this doesn't mean we're perfect. This doesn't mean I've never caused a brother to stumble. What it's saying is, it's talking about the difference between um, a person who's walking a certain pattern in life, the the trajectory of your life, the, the big picture of your life, the, the, the things you're doing is not causing other brothers to stumble. It doesn't mean being perfect. John makes that clear uh, at the beginning of chapter two. Let's read that verse again. First John two, verse one. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you that you might not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous but this doesn't mark the pattern of our life. Either your life is characterized by walking in the light or your life is characterized by walking in the darkness. In John's gospel, chapter three, uh, verse 19, it says, this is the verdict, talking about Jesus. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and has been done in the sight of God. It doesn't mean we never mess up. It doesn't mean we never stumble. It doesn't mean we never fall. But the true believer um, is exposing himself to the light so that God can change him. The light of God living in you, it convicts you of sin. It leads you into all truth. It helps you walk righteously. We already already mentioned this one, but John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How about John 12, 35? Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. What is he saying? He's giving a evangelistic plea. He's saying, listen, light has come into the world and and, and the darkness cannot overcome it, but there will come a time where the the opportunity to be be children of light will be over. The lost do not know where they're going because they're walking in the dark. And John is saying in verse 11 that those who hate their brothers, even if they call themselves a Christian by profession, are in the same condition. They are lost and walking in the darkness because our heart, while there is light, is that none would perish, but that all would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. So if someone is outside the faith, we hope that they become part of the faith. And if someone is our brother in the faith, we want to make peace with them for the glory and honor of Christ, who we're both supposedly living for and walking towards. In conclusion, we'll discuss the the stages of growth for those who truly belong to the light. And this is dealt with in, in verses 12 through 14. So let's just look at verse 12 very quickly. John says, I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. 
So the literal Greek translation of the, of the phrase little children is actually probably better rendered born ones. What is he saying when he says little children? He's not saying that, he's not necessarily talking to those immature in the faith. He'll address them in a minute. But when he says little children, he's talking about those who have been reborn into the family of God. John is talking to those who are true children of God. So he was giving a test, uh, the first part of this sermon, explaining that if you don't love your brother, that you're probably not walking in the light, that the truth is not in you. You can't hate your brother and claim to love the God who made him. And so John here now switches gears and he's talking to true believers. Because remember, this letter is a letter of encouragement to a church that has been rocked by a mass exodus of people who think that they're, they're spiritually high-minded people. They're spiritual, but not religious. They believe in the God of the universe, but maybe not as written in this word. And so John wants to give assurance to them in all stages of their sanctification. Christians who are brand new, Christians who are walking this thing out in the middle, and those who are seeing or as he will call them, fathers of the faith. John is talking to the reborn ones, the regenerate. And John is tying the promise of forgiveness of our sins to the believer. He's tying this, this concept of our sins being forgiven to what? The very name of God. And if you know anything about God and how he holds his name, that is a powerful statement. So as for the born of God, those who are born again, those who have, who have been, who have come into Christ, we can be sure of the forgiveness of our sins because God holds it the same value on that promise as he does on his name. God always keeps his word. His name has value because his word has value. His promises has never been broken. His covenants have never not been fulfilled. God is a man of his word. And here's a quick one that has nothing to do with the sermon. If you're a Christian, you should be a man of your word too. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Don't speak idle words that you can't back up. Your word better mean something. If it doesn't, you need to take a look in the mirror and ask yourself, Why? Those who are born of God can be so sure that their sins are forgiven. Because listen, when the false teachers who are speaking to these people start rocking their faith, what they're really rocking is not only the fact, the, the question of Jesus, you start asking questions about the inerrancy of scripture, you start asking questions about the, the, the humanity of Christ or the divinity of Christ. If you, if you really let yourself go down that road, then what, what really has to be shaken is, am I right with God? Or is there even a God? Listen, deconstruction always leads to apostasy. I know some really clever, intelligent Christians today are using the term deconstruction and they're saying they're trying to be relevant with the world. And they're saying, no, 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 we're just deconstructing the parts of the faith that aren't Christian. Then stop using the world's terminology because it almost seems like you're saying that so the world can agree with you. We're going to talk about being in agreement with the world next week, but I, I, I digress. Those of us who are born of God can be sure of the forgiveness of our sins because we are sure of the word of God. And we are sure of the word that was made flesh. And we are sure of the name of God and the value of that name. Wow. God grants repentance and forgiveness, excuse me, to those sinners who who, who, who repent before God, not based on merit or anything we've done, but listen, simply for his namesake. A lot of times we read Psalm 23 and we skip over one of the most important parts of it. Listen, it says, Psalm 23, one through three, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. His name is above all names. His name is worthy of all glory and honor forever. And God keeps his promises to us because of his name's sake. The term for his namesake is referring to the honor and the glory of God. If you understand the holiness of God, you will understand how serious this is, which should help us rest in the promises of God 
in regard to our salvation, the assurance of that salvation. So let's look at the last two verses. John says, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. It sounds like I repeated myself, but he does repeat some phrases there because in verse 12, um, and 12 through 14, John is speaking in a particular sort of uh, rigid grammatical poetry that makes sense if you understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to reiterate something over and over and validate something. But in verse 12, John is calling all believers. Remember when he says little children, the translation is reborn ones or um, little children, he says there, those who have actually been born into the family of God. These are those whose sins are forgiven for the glory of God's namesake so that in this, the God of the gospel has given us the assurance of our salvation. So verse 12 is, is making it clear that the next verses, the three groups of people he's about to address, children, young men, and fathers, that all three of these are real Christians. They are all under the category of reborn ones. So now in verses 13 and 14, John speaks to three different stages of spiritual growth. In verses 12 through 14, like I said, John is speaking in a grammatically strict form of Greek poetry. So six times he says the phrase, I am writing to you. And six times he says, because you. So verse 12, like I said, makes it clear that all through three groups of these people are referring to true Christians, reborn ones, God's little children, all true Christians. And remember, John is writing in opposition of what the Gnostics who have departed the church uh, are, are, are influencing these true Christians with. Maybe saying that these believers who had felt held fast to the teachings of the apostle about Jesus, that maybe they're wrong, or maybe there's more to it. You know, that some, a false gospel isn't always subtracting from the gospel. Sometimes it's just adding stuff to it. That's what the, the, the legalistic Judaizers were doing. They're saying, sure, sure, Jesus died for us and stuff, but you better live out the law like, like the Jews do. Greeks who want to be Christians. And Paul says, no, no, no. Listen, the gospel is enough. The gospel is everything. Everything hinges on the gospel of Jesus Christ to the point in Galatians chapter one, where Paul says, let anyone be damned. Let anyone be cursed who would bring a different gospel to you because it's that important. They're messing with people's surety of salvation. So let's kind of walk through these verses. I just want to real quickly say, verse 13, he says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him from, who is from the beginning. And in the beginning of verse 14, he repeats himself. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. So he's basically reiterating his stage. I'm writing to you because you. So you are part of this. And here's what sets you apart as a mature Christian. And then he, he, he addresses young men. He says, because you have overcome the evil one, I write to you. And then in verse 14, he, he reiterates it, but he adds something to it. He says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. So why are you strong? Because the word of God abides in you. And then in, at the end of verse 13, he only addresses children once, and I'll tell you why in a second. But he says, children, I write to you because you know the Father. And there's only one way to know the Father, and that's through relationship with Jesus Christ. So, Let's, let's kind of just backtrack and walk through these in the, next, the last handful of minutes we have here. First, he addresses God's assurance to fathers. These are the spiritually mature people who have walked out their faith over a long period of time. Those who have held fast to their faith and have taught others to do the same people's path who is marked by walking in the light, um, who live above reproach, people who are fathers in the faith. This, this has something to do with age, but, but maybe it doesn't. There are fathers in the faith who are middle-aged people who have been walking with God. There are men my age that I consider fathers in the faith because they have been walking this thing out twice as long as I have. 
So he addresses the assurance of God's gospel to fathers in the faith, and he solidifies their place by using one phrase, and it's a powerful phrase. These are spiritually mature people because they know him who is from the beginning. John doesn't list a a list of worldly accomplishments or, or give them worldly titles or even church administrative titles. Those mature in the faith, those who are truly mature in God's eyes, they may be in different places in the church. Some of them are pastors. Maybe some of them are just lay people who've been walking this thing out as an example to the glory and power of God for, for decades. But he doesn't address them by worldly titles or, or church stature or accomplishments, how many buildings you build, how many books you write. No, no, no. What, what, what designates this group of men are those who, who know who know he who is from the beginning. Knowing God, this is the the, the quintessential uh, solidifying factor of the Christian mature, a person who knows God, who walks in the light. Listen, God took Enoch. It says he walked with God and knew him and he took him. (laughs) This is what the, the purpose of the Christian life is, is to know God, to know God, the Lord, to walk with him. The ancient of days, who was from the beginning, the alpha, the omega, Jesus Christ, the beginning and the end. These are men who know him in relationship, in prayer, and is revealed in his word. And that's what characterizes their life. These are the men that, that, that follow God and their life follows God and their example gives them credibility to teach others to do the same. The opposite of this is true. When Jesus casts people out in Matthew 7, 21, listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Look at all the stuff we did, God. Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The absolute scariest words in the scripture. Jesus makes a similar statement at the end of the parable of the 10 virgins, five wise virgins, five foolish virgins. You know, the the only thing that differentiated the two is one was prepared with oil and the other didn't have it. The oil of the Holy Spirit that, that signifies that you belong to God, the preparedness that took God at his word, that took the bridegroom at his word, that was longing for his appearing. Listen, the five wise ones have the the oil in their lamps and they go into the wedding celebration. It says the door is shut. And then the five foolish virgins come and they knock and they say, Lord, Lord, open to us. Let us in. And his response is the same as in Matthew 7. But he answered them. This is Matthew 25, 12. He answered them, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour, the urgency of the gospel. How about 1 John 2, 3? Here's the positive side. So those are the people who don't know God. Here's the people who do know, do know God. 1 John 2, 3. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. How? If we keep his commands. 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you could say you know God, but if, if you don't love, you don't really know him. Here's another test. How about 1 John 4, 16? It says, so we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us because God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And it's saying, listen, fathers, you're mature Christians because you know the word, you live it out, you do it in love, and in this characterized and has characterized your life over the course of a long period of time. Listen, there are a lot of people who are old in church who aren't fathers, who aren't spiritually mature, people who seem almost like dead branches who aren't actually connected to the tree of life. I worry about those people a lot. So we're talking about knowing God who was from the beginning, 
knowing God from his word, the, the God who prophesied about Christ, the God who made himself flesh and died for our sins. Listen, knowing God. Secondly, he addresses God's assurance for young men. These are those who are walking out their faith. This is why he says, because you have overcome the evil one. This is someone who is growing in faith, who is walking in light. And John wants them to remember to hold fast to Christ, to hold fast to the gospel and to hold fast to his word. That is, that is why they have overcome the evil one. John 16, 33 says, Jesus speaking, he said, I have said these things to you that in me, you might have peace in this world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, listen, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the evil one. What does it say in the book of James? It says, resist the devil and he will flee. No, that's not what it says. It says, submit yourself then to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee. Submit yourself to God. Abide in his word and let his word abide in you. Listen, that person who doesn't, who knows the promise of God, who has the gospel of God deep in their heart, who understands the truth of God in a living way, that person has and will continue to overcome the evil one. He says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Men who are strong and maturing in the faith are men who are abiding in God's word and God's word is abiding in them. This is the key to knowing God. This is the key to maturing in the faith. It's the same language that we see Jesus use in John 15. John 15, seven, Jesus speaking, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might be in you and that your joy may be full. This is the path to Christian maturity. It's not a bunch of secular nonsense. It's not a bunch of Gnostic revelations. It's abiding in God's word and by a spirit having his word abide in you. It will actually transform the way you live. This is the thing. It's not about salvation by works. It's saying if the spirit of God lives in you, if the word of God is actually taking root in you, it's gonna change the way you live. And people are gonna see in different areas of your life in an ever increasing way that you are overcoming the evil one, not by your own power, Power, but through the love of God and the gospel, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And finally, he addresses God's assurance to baby Christians. He says, I write to you children because you know the Father. Listen, this is the basic assurance of salvation for infants in the faith. But there's no secondary validation made for them because no one is meant to stay an infant. This isn't meant to be a, a long season of your life. And see, when people start talking about the milk of God's word, oftentimes they say, you're preaching milk. And they say, you're just preaching about the gospel and Jesus. Where's the deep stuff? Listen, milk is not, um, is not those things aren't milk. Milk means that you're actually able to, in a very juvenile way, walk out the things that you hear. Listen, there are tons of people who are hearers of the word, but have no ability to be doers of the word because the spirit of God doesn't actually live in them. And John wants to make a clear distinction between these people, but he's saying, listen, if in fact you are the baby Christian, you're the person who, who doesn't know the things of God yet, there, there's no excuse for staying that way. But if you don't know these things, be assured in your salvation in this fact. Through Christ, you know the Father. That's all it takes. I mean, the evidence of that is seen on the cross where the two thieves are on either side of Jesus and one repents of his sin and confesses faith in Christ. And he says, surely today you'll be with me in paradise. I saw a, a meme on Facebook that said, what do you do? How does your theology reconcile to the thief on the cross, almost like making it seem like 
that, that Christians don't have to bear fruit. Listen, this guy bore fruit. He bore the fruit of repentance. And if by some miracle he would have came off that cross, I assure you, he would have been a student and disciple of God's word and sanctification would have happened in his life. And he would have walked towards Christ. He would have had a life marked of walking in the light because there is no such thing as Christians who don't mature in the faith. And there is no such thing as Christians who don't change. Second Peter 2, 2 says this. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and all envy and all slander like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk that you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. How about Hebrews 5, 12 through 13? It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again of someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness for he is an infant. How about 2 Corinthians 2, 6? Listen, he's saying, listen, there is a difference, but there, there are deep things of God. There are spiritual fathers who understand the truth of God's word, who walk it out and live by faith. 2 Corinthians 2, 6 says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. For we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God declared before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, or heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this, and these words are not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, I don't have time to unpack this all the way, but I just wanted to, just wanted to use it as a reference point. The, the truth, listen, he's talking about the truth of the gospel, the mystery of the ages. This is the deep spiritual things. You will gaze at the cross and it will get deeper and more consuming and it will transform your life and you will walk in the light more and more. Just in summary here, children are saved simply because they know God. Young men are maturing and walking in victory and have overcome the evil one because they are strong. And they are strong, not because they are strong-minded or strong-willed, but because the word of God abides in them. And fathers are mature because they are men who know God as the one who is from the beginning. Unshakable, faithful, steadfast, this is the healthy, maturing process of Christian sanctification in the life of the believer. And the relation between all three of these groups is what? Mutual love for each other. This is evidence you belong to Christ. Meditate on these words. Go back and read these. Let the, let the truth of these invade your heart. Examine your life through the word of God. Listen, those, those who got, listen, God finds us in all sorts of conditions, but he don't leave us the way he found us. There's no such thing as, as imposing a sinful lifestyle and calling ourselves um, a so-and-so Christian. There's no such thing as a homosexual Christian. There's no such thing as an adulterous Christian. There's no such thing as a thieving Christian or a murdering Christian. You may fall into these sins, but if they characterize your life, then maybe you're not walking in the light. This isn't condemnation. This is saying that the spirit of God is the power to set you free in the gospel. John said in his gospel, he who the son sets free shall be free indeed. So if you're struggling in some part of, of your, your Christian sanctification, abide in God's word and let the spirit of God's word and his word abide in you. Pray and seek God. 
He won't, listen, he will not abandon you. The question is, when the light comes, do you attract into the darkness because you hate the light? You can go to church and do that. You can pretend to be a Christian and do that. Look at this maturing process. Look at sanctification. See if your justification is validated by the fruit and evidence of your life. This isn't meant to bring condemnation. This is conforming to the image of Christ. God, I thank you for your word. It's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, let that light shine out of us, God, into a dark and lost world. Lord, let it also validate that we are of you, God, that we belong to you. And Lord, let us not, let's not shy away from the parts of your word that we don't like or we don't understand. Let us dig in deep, God, and pray that your spirit would lead us into all truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.